You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Tuesday, November 27th, 2018. Nice. My name is Sam Cedar. This is <clears throat> the Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, eating NAFTA, obesity, diabetes, and free trade. Meanwhile, Paul Manafort's plea deal falls apart. A new report says he had multiple secret meetings with Julian Assange leading up to the release of those hacked emails. GM to lay off 15,000 people, close plants in Ohio, Michigan, Maryland after billions of stock buybacks. And millions, hundreds of millions of tax benefits from the Trump administration. Meanwhile, Republicans want more tax cuts in the lame duck. And the midterm elections are now over, folks. Democrats pick up another in California, Orange County, all blue. The total number, they flipped 40 and got the largest national midterm win ever. Great victory for us. Mark Penn. Turns out Mark Penn involved in the no labels assault on Nancy Pelosi. And will a suit against Apple's App Store revive antitrust? Lastly, Bernie Sanders will force a Senate vote on the ending uh, our Yemen support. All this and more on today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are back. Full compliment now in studio after the holidays. Uh, apropos of today's uh, topic, Jamie is back from uh, south of the border. Here I am. How was it? It was so amazing. Oh, my God. All right. Well, we'll have to hear more uh, later in the program. But amazing sounds good. Um, <clears throat> and they let you back in across the border? You know, they did. Um, I feel like I'm pretty low on the totem pole in terms of uh, political revocations of passports. But, uh, you know, if they start fucking with folks like Noam Chomsky, I might uh, think twice about whether or not I want to stay here. But for now, it's all good. There you go, folks. Um, all right. Well, uh, we will we will get into this. Uh, guests coming uh, just a, a little bit uh, later than normal uh, on today's program. Uh, but we will get there shortly. Uh, meanwhile, this GM story is big for a number of reasons. And um, let me just start with this. I got an email uh, from... Listener Miles. Hey, Sam. I'm a 10th grader who is a big fan of the show. Smart kid. Very smart smart kid. kid. I was curious about your assessment of trade policy in light of the 15,000 jobs lost from GM. I know you've been critical about Trump's trade war and international tariffs. I know also that the progressive movement and prominent social Democrats had harsh criticism and opposition towards TPP, NAFTA, and PNTR among other free trade agreements. I'm not even familiar necessarily with the PNTR, I don't think, off the top of my head. Permanent normalized... uh, Trade relations. Is that the one, the European one? I would assume so. I don't think Uh, But no, PNTR was with China years ago. I don't know what the most recent one is. 
To be honest, I'm not uh, positive 100% if you oppose these deals and support renegotiating them, uh, but I know this idea was a key tenet of the Sanders campaign and many leftist political organizations. Has your position changed on protectionism because of the effects under Trump, or is there something specific about Trump's protectionism that puts it at odds with, say, uh, Bernie Sanders? Um, yes. Well, my position has not uh, changed broadly on protectionism. I think... Um, that may be a little bit narrow. The The problem is we have a, a free full flow of of capital. We do not have a free fro, uh, flow of, of labor. And broadly speaking, that is, is problematic. And we do not uh, require in the context of these deals the uh, safeguards for labor, environment, consumer um, in uh, that is bilateral or is uh, reciprocal. And that's problematic for for both ends uh, on that deal. Um, today's guest is going to speak to to this dynamic in particular. And then, of course, I have problems with, in particular, the um, uh, the resolution dispute system that is really contrary to the sovereignty of, of the countries and, and completely anti-democratic. Um, but we will uh, talk uh, more about that with today's guest. And as far as GM, it's unclear to me that the issue is now that the issue is a function of Trump's tariffs. And incidentally, thank you for the email. Um, Oh, this kid's in 10th grade? Yeah. Very, very yeah. intelligent. Mm. Yeah. Clever little devil. Yes. Or not. I was going to say, I hope uh, Mila gets there in 10th grade. Boom. Yeah. Shots fired. Um, I don't know that you could attribute what's happening with GM to the, the tariffs on Chinese steel. Certainly, when Ford... Uh, it was announced, or I should say reported, that Ford was uh, preparing to lay off uh, 12% of its workforce. I think it was like something like 24,000 people. Um, the, um, the implication was that it was a function of the steel tariffs. I haven't seen that type of reporting with GM. What we have seen is that the tax breaks... The tax gifts, the giveaways to GM that the Republicans promised us was going to end up in workers' pockets did not end up in workers' pockets. What we also did see is five years, four years of stock buybacks, which, recall, was an illegal practice until Ronald Reagan decided that it no longer was. And what these stock buybacks do, and I've said this on this program ad nauseum, is it simply pays off the biggest shareholders, which, contrary to what some on the right will tell you, is not pension holders. It is the CEOs, the C-suite members, the board of directors, and some very wealthy individuals. 84% of the stocks in this country are owned by the top uh, 20% of the people. And uh, so this is a, a broader story. I don't know if it's directly attributable to the uh, steel tariffs, but another part of the story, in addition to the stock buybacks and the wealthy lining their pockets, is, of course, that... Promises made, promises not quite kept. Here is Donald Trump. This is from 20, uh, what was this, in 2017? 2016? Uh, 2016 in Warren, Michigan, ladies and gentlemen. Warren, Michigan. Here is Donald Trump. He says about Hillary is so bad. He said she has terrible instincts. But we have good instincts. And I've been saying your car industry is being sucked away from Michigan. It's happening. If I'm elected, you won't lose one plant 
You'll have plants coming into this country. You're going to have jobs again. You won't lose one plant. I promise you that. Yes. Well, uh, if you lived in Warren, Michigan, and you worked at the GM's plant, a transmission plant in Warren, Michigan, um, I've got some bad news for you. He lied. Uh, Now, of course, it was a silly promise for him to make in the first place, but uh, Warren, Michigan lost its plant. Uh, It was one of the uh, at least six, maybe I think nine plants that were shut down uh, by GM. Here is Donald Trump in Youngstown, Ohio, in 2017. I was looking at some of those big, once incredible job-producing factories, and my wife, Melania, said, what happened? I said, those jobs have left Ohio. They're all coming back. They're all coming back. Coming back. Don't move. Don't sell your house. Don't sell your house. Remember, I got a lot of credit. This is hard to believe, but the press gave me a lot of credit because a number of years ago I said, this is the time to buy a house during one of my speeches. I said, go out and buy. And they did this big story got all over that Trump predicted. Let me tell you folks in Ohio and in this area, don't sell your house. Don't sell your house. Do not sell it. We're going to get those values up. We're going to get those jobs coming back. And we're going to fill up those factories or rip them down and build brand new ones. That's what's going to happen. Uh, Lordstown, Ohio, lost uh, one of its plants in this uh, closing. So uh, Get a new credit card, too. But look, the the bigger story, uh, aside from the fact that uh, Donald Trump's a pathological liar, and if you believed him, then um, uh, there was not enough caveat emptors out there. Um, is GM over the past four years had $14 billion, $14 billion worth of stock buybacks. Now, their closing say, uh, in their closing announcement, they say they're going to save $6 billion annually by firing 15,000 people. $14 14 billion dollars half of which come has come in the last 2 years. There was a story uh I saw this at um I don't know it's like one of those uh stock stock places Wolf Street. And the guy wrote after wasting 14 billion on share buybacks GM prepares for Carmageddon. Uh, closes eight plants. But here's the thing, is that this concept that they were incompetent, right, that they wasted this money is what is the problem here. They didn't waste the money. The people who made these decisions made off like bandits. They are extremely wealthy now because of these decisions. They would look at this and say, waste, what are you talking about? We made millions, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions probably of dollars. We bought back our stock. We raised the value of our stock. We are compensated in stock because capital gains taxes are cheaper on stock. And then we sold the stock. We paid less in taxes than we would have if we actually went out and worked for that money. If we had gotten paid in wages. And we're super wealthy. And we didn't have to make better cars. We didn't have to help any communities. We didn't have to provide for our employees. We made out like bandits. This was not wasted. (laughs) We did exactly what we wanted to do. Mission accomplished. And of course, you know, then we had to lay off um, 15,000 people. What are you going to do? Competition would start kicking in. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. 
if I may, um, there are some people who want to equate uh, Trump's sort of uh, phony opposition to uh, globalization with uh, Bernie's what um, Bernie's real opposition to the problems caused by globalization and neoliberalism. Um, and like some of his rhetoric, some of Bernie's rhetoric has sounded somewhat economically nationalist. But I think they're coming at the problem from two very, very different directions. Um, and especially lately, I've seen some good, uh, good stuff coming from the Bernie camp on how to deal with these problems in a way that is actually constructive, um, which involves supporting uh, an internationalist workers movement, not um, closing the borders. Well, the 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 bottom line is, and, and, and when we talk to our guest today, is that these trade deals, um, among other things, um, don't necessarily favor one com- a country over another. It favors one class of individuals over exactly. the other. Exactly, and that in that respect, it's uh, there's a certain reciprocity. <laughs> We're going to get uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican millionaires and billionaires richer, and we're going to get American millionaires and billionaires richer. So it's, b- it's truly bilateral. Um, it's a win-win. You win-win. But we will uh, talk to her uh, momentarily. In the meantime, um, you've heard me. Uh, today, we have two sponsors today that I am super excited about, both products that I use, um, well, I guess technically daily. I certainly use my toothbrush daily. One would hope. One would certainly hope. In fact, I use it more than daily. I use it at least twice daily. Go for three. Sometimes I do. Uh, When you think of the perfect gift, you probably don't think of an electric toothbrush. But the Quip electric toothbrush is one of the most gift-guided gifts of the season. Oh, I guess that means they're in a bunch of gift guides. For me, I've actually given... The quip as a gift. It's it is it's a good gift. It is the perfect sibling or um, like family gift. I don't know if I would give it to like you know your like a, it's not a romantic gift. What but are you trying to say? I'm just saying. My breath not good enough. No, I'm not. What? Whoa! See, this is <laughs> oh, I see like, what you Okay, I see. Very saying. dangerous. That's right. There. That's right. Gift but. Here's why. It's, the per- it's perfect for everyone with a mouth. And they'll use it twice a day. They'll think of you. You know, I have, uh, I have a quip. I don't know if this is even going to come up in this, but they have a special all black one. Ooh. Yeah. I'm actually thinking about buying a new toothbrush because it's more stylish. Uh, plus a multi-use cover that mounts to mirrors and unmounts. It's not in the ad. I shouldn't have probably even talked about it. Uh, and unmounts to slide over the bristles. Quip makes holiday travels clean and easy. And with sensitive sonic vibrations, it's gentle enough for sensitive gums. Better yet, the built-in timer pulses to remind you when to switch sides. It is, you'd be surprised how important that is. Um, I love my Quip. It is an it is the only electric truth spot that I think you can actually travel with uh, without feeling like you're a dork. Uh, it's stylish, super effective, makes it super easy to clean. And when they send you the uh, refills, it reminds you to change your uh, brush heads. That's why I love my Quip and why they have over 5,000 verified five-star reviews. Quip looks like a big ticket tech gift with a stocking stuffer price starting at just 25 bucks and if you go to getquip.com slash majority right now you get your first refill pack free with a quip electric toothbrush but you don't have to tell your giftee that you just go and get your first refill pack free at getquip g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash majority this next sponsor okay i've mentioned this before our a media broker sends us a list of uh, companies to uh, approve of. I barely ever get to look at that list because it's just I don't have the time. Occasionally I go in there and I look and see what the products are because I'm not going to approve of stuff that I think is dicey or, or whatever it is. One of those times, it was last year, probably right around now, I saw StoryWorth. 
StoryWorth makes it easy and fun for your loved ones to share their stories so you can get to know them in a whole new way with questions you never thought to ask. All right, so here's how it works. You purchase a subscription for someone you love or someone you like, someone you're interested in. Um, each week, StoryWorth sends them an email with a question about their life. They simply reply with their story or they can record it over the phone by calling the StoryWorth number so they can dictate it. All stories are private. They're only shared with family that you choose. You can easily and securely save and edit all your stories on StoryWorth.com. And after a year, the stories will be bound into a beautiful keepsake book. Brings families together every week. It's a great way to connect with your loved ones. You learn about your relatives, preserve your memories for future generations. If you want to do like a family tree type of thing, you send it out to all your family members. Uh, StoryWorth makes a great gift for the holidays and any of your loved ones who enjoy telling stories. And you know what? More so, from my perspective, this is why I did it. I sent it to both my parents. Because I don't know much about their lives. Even now. Because I was never terribly interested. And, but I realized, like, you know, you want this uh, recording. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you're a kid. I you don't, don't care. As a kid, you don't care. My, my daughter could care less about my life now or before. Clearly. But someday when she gets older, she's going to be like, I wonder what dad was like as a kid. You, well, you know, when you get, you get hopefully. more mature. Hopefully. 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 Um, so I sent it but. to both my parents. Uh, we're compiling this stuff now. We're almost at the end of the year. It must have been for Hanukkah last year. And uh, then I'm going to send them a book. I'm going to send my, my sister's uh, books from my parents. It works multiple different ways. So you can get 20 bucks off. Visit storyworth.com slash majority when you subscribe. That's storyworth, S-T-O-R-Y, worth, W-O-R-T-H dot com slash majority for 20 bucks off. This is a great idea. That is a good idea. I might actually do that. It, it, it is. Sometimes you got to get on some of the parents. One, I'm not going to name names. One of my parents was a little more diligent about it than... Um, than the other parent. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, they got divorced a long time ago. I'm not going to open old wounds, but, um, but you just got to get on them. And then when they do, it's great. Um, and, but it's, I think something I may do for my sisters too. send to my sisters. And then I can give that to my kids. That's the thing. You can get the gifts coming both ways. All right, look, uh, enough of that. Uh, but it's, it's exciting to have a, um, product that you like uh all right i'm gonna just touch on this briefly next week we'll have marcy wheeler on the program to talk about this uh in a greater detail but what has happened with manafort over the uh, past couple days is a big big deal here is the two or three minute wrap-up you'll recall in september Mueller made a big plea deal with Paul Manafort, stripped Paul Manafort of all his, his assets. He's broke now. Uh, totally broke. But $46 million came in, paid for the Mueller investigation. Okay. They said uh, they got him on a couple of charges. They got him off on another charges, but it was all contingent upon him being truthful and providing good information. So yesterday or the day before, Mueller announces, guess what? Paul Manafort's been lying to us. We know he's been lying to us. We are going to lay out at his sentencing hearing, because we want him now to go to jail, all of the details about what he lied to us. And at that time, it became apparent that Mueller didn't even need Manafort. To prove whatever they needed to prove because they knew everything that he was giving them was a lie. And then the question becomes, why would you do that? Why would Paul Manafort lie to Mueller? Well, Manafort is not the brightest. He has gotten away with this stuff for decades. He thought he could pull the wool over Manafort, uh, over Mueller's eyes. He's banking on a pardon from the Trump administration. And by copping a plea, he doesn't have to pay for lawyers who are litigating all these cases. 
And if he knows he's getting a pardon, he knows he's getting a pardon. How does he know he's getting a pardon? There's probably some contact with the Trump administration. But that means the flow of information is going two different ways. Manafort is finding out he's going to get a pardon. And maybe Manafort is sending back information the other way to Donald Trump, telling him that, What's going on with the investigation? What are they asking? What is Manafort saying in his lies? Unfair. Right? So it comes out today in The Guardian that Paul Manafort was visiting Julian Assange in the embassy since 2013. Probably doing all sorts of different type of work with WikiLeaks in some way. Unless he was just a real fan of WikiLeaks. Felt very, very strongly about uh, the work they were doing uh, uh, with Chelsea Manning. <laughs> right? He was looking for hacked emails. He was looking for information or other things. By 2016, he visits right before in the month of March. A lot of things go down in March. Right after he visits Julian Assange. The phishing email leads to the hack of Podesta's personal email. Trump names Papadopoulos, Page, Carter Page as advisors. Papadopoulos lunches with Misfud or Mifsfud and Putin's niece. <laughs> Papadopoulos just went to jail, incidentally. Manafort named the unpaid convention manager all within 10 or 15 days of that meeting. 20 days. Mueller probably knew all this. There is apparently videotape. I'm saying that only because it, nobody said that, but they are, there's a description of what Manafort was wearing when he went into the embassy. Here's the thing. If it's the case that Manafort was sending back information to Trump, this is what I'm telling Mueller. We're really pulling the wool over this guy's eyes. Donald Trump probably intook that information and then spewed it back out when he wrote his written questions, written answers to the questions that Mueller had asked him, which was submitted last week. So you understand the dynamic here. This is a case of a teacher giving a test. I'm going to give a special test to you, Matt, because uh, you're going to be sick or you're going away. So we're going to give you the test five days early. Here's the test, Matt. You fill it out. You go tell your buddies what's on the test. I'm they all set, fill it out. I'm all set for the test. They, Thanks, they write in the answers for the test. But it turns out your teacher pulled a fast one on you, Matt. The teacher knew that you were of not a terribly... Um, it's a bit uh, disturbing how much you scrupulous. enjoy this. I, it's, I think it's amazing. I if this is actually what happened, Matt, um, he gave you a fake test to see if you would pass it to your buddy. And when that test came back from your buddy, you realized you did. Except for the difference here is not just that you flunk. It's that you've purged yourself about stuff they already knew. And they had the worst cover-up ever. <laughs> we will be talking. We will be talking to Marcy Wheeler about this in about four or five days. Hopefully not too much more will happen. But uh, this is going to be uh, this is. We're, we're headed towards Crazyville. Crazyville. Yeah. That, that's what he said. I, I, that's what I said. That's obviously what the, the, our position is. Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, Paul Manafort is going to um, probably spend the better part of the rest of his days in prison. Unless there, of course, is a pardon. But it turns out a lot of those uh, things that uh, Mueller will now be recharging Manafort with are also um, state violations as well. And Manafort has no cash um, to fight those. It's going to be tough. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Alicia Galvez on eating NAFTA, obesity, diabetes, and free trade. We'll be right back.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program the author of Eating NAFTA, Trade, Food Policies, and the Destruction of Mexico. She is a professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at City University of New York and an anthropologist by training. Alicia Galvez, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So our... Uh, obviously, um, our relationship with Mexico has been uh, in the news. Uh, trade has been in the news um, recently. Donald Trump, I guess, um, tentatively renegotiated NAFTA. Um, le- just, I guess, let's just start with the question of like, why approach NAFTA um, and this relationship between Mexico and the United States um, from from the perspective of of food and eating? Well, it's one of the ways that trade gets to us, really. It's it's one of the most direct ways that our lives are impacted by trade deals. Most of us are not, you know, dealing in, um, you know, chips or circuitry or um, car parts or, or airplane parts, but all of us eat. So it's one of the best ways that we have to kind of see how these things operate. And so um, is it is that particular in terms of our relationship with Mexico? I mean, or is it uh, particularly with our relationship with Mexico? Uh, Yeah, it's not exclusive with Mexico, but there's no country um, that we have a closer relationship to in terms of our food systems. So we get uh, I live in New York City and, you know, much of the fresh fruit and vegetables that I eat comes from from Mexico and a few other trading partners. We also get stuff, obviously, from Chile and from New Zealand and things like that. But there uh, there is a lot of the produce that uh, gets consumed in the United States is coming from Mexico. And they're consuming a lot of our um, commodity grains. A lot of the corn and soy and wheat um, that gets produced in the United States is being consumed on the Mexican side um, in the form both of uh, processed foods and beverages, but also animal feed, um, which is contributing to a, you know, a large growth in terms of um, the the market for, for meat. So, all right. So let's, I mean, uh, give us, let's go back and give us um, a little bit of the, the sort of the pre NAFTA history, I guess. And, um, mm-hmm. and then, and then we'll go into NAFTA because uh, that dynamic of this exchange of food is, um, I mean, largely a function of NAFTA in many respects. Right. Well, NAFTA is really a product of the thinking of a few, um, mainly University of Chicago educated economists um, who were operating in all three countries. So Mexico's economic uh, policymakers typically have studied in the University of Chicago, as have U.S. policymakers and Canadian as well, I assume. Um, And we uh, have a, you know, a a Milton Friedman you know, motivated orientation towards uh, the free market, um, towards taking down barriers to trade in the interest of the expansion of capitalism that, you know, really comes to dominate thinking about economic development and economic policy in the 20th century. Um, And that thinking, you know, basically uh, prefers – foreign direct investment, um, taking away any sort of barriers to to cross-border trade, getting rid of tariffs and subsidies and things like that, so that capital and goods can flow freely across borders. Um, That sort of thinking was so dominant that, you know, Margaret Thatcher famously said at one point, there is no alternative. You know, this is kind of the the economic model that Reagan Thatcherism produced. And we see it... um, you know, turning into very concrete policy proposals. So NAFTA is one of those policy proposals. And the idea is to sort of knit together the three countries of North America into a single economic market. Um, Unlike, you know, other examples we can think of, like the European community that took away barriers to the circulation of people, we never really had a serious conversation about taking away barriers to people. Um, but we did try to take away barriers to goods and capital to try to create a single unified market. And that was where NAFTA came from. 
Um, you know, uh, and we should say this was a, a longtime uh, libertarian um, uh, a policy agenda in many respects. This uh, internationalism, this is, you know, uh, one of the things I think that came out of Mont uh, Pellerin uh, was this this notion of of bringing down these barriers to capital and um, on some level sort of fighting against the sovereignty of nations, at least in this respect. Right. It's yeah. uh, um, and uh, and I think actually we interviewed someone about it. Uh, we're looking for the name right now. But um, um, we this was a long term agenda. And in many respects, NAFTA was a um, it wasn't the culmination. It was a, one of the one of the culminations, I guess. And so. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this. All right. So this dynamic, I mean, this is really fundamentally the the issue, isn't it? Or Or, or, or is it that. There is a disequilibrium in terms of what can what can cross borders easily and what can't or who can't. Yeah. Well, there are a few problems. And maybe because I'm not an economist, maybe because I'm an anthropologist, I'm able to see some of those problems in ways that um, they're visible perhaps to me in ways that they aren't to, to other disciplines. Because there are some sort of um, taken for granted um mantras within this sort of thinking that I find a little bit um, hard to, to understand and hard to believe. So, so one of them is um, the idea that what NAFTA is, is free trade. Um, and if we, you know, kind of look at what free trade is supposed to be, it's supposed to be getting rid of barriers to trade, getting rid of subsidies, anything that kind of artificially gets in the way of the market doing its thing. Um, but if we look at NAFTA, NAFTA was never a free trade agreement in spite of its name. Uh, the United States never got rid of its subsidies. Um, we still famously, you know, pay farmers to grow corn, whether we need corn or not, um, to grow wheat, to grow uh, commodity soybeans, et cetera. And so we have a market that's already not a free, you know, marketplace where supply and demand are determining everything. So that's one thing. Um, another idea that's very sacred in this sort of thinking is the idea of um, comparative advantage. And this is the idea that, you know, if one place is good at something, they should do all of that thing and other places. So if the U.S. is good at corn, the U.S. should produce all the corn for everybody who wants corn, and nobody else should bother because they can't do it as well as the United States can. And so maybe Mexico can build airplanes and work on car parts and, and leave the corn growing to the U.S. Um, this is a very central idea to NAFTA, and it's part of the reason why NAFTA is such a problem for public health and Mexican culture and, and for the health of people in the United States as well. Because basically, not all corn is the same. The commodity corn that we grow in, in Iowa is not edible. It's not sustainable in the same way that heirloom corn, land race corn is um, in, in small-scale farming in, in Mexico. It can't be eaten the same way. It can't be used the same way. It doesn't have the same symbolic or cultural value. Um, so there's this idea of sort of equivalence that gets constructed that's really not um, – not very uh, logical or or um, coherent, I, and then I, related to that, yeah, sorry. Okay, well, you know what? I mean, I just want to I want to just flag that because I want to return to yeah. that dynamic. I think it's really important to talk about, but 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 continue, and we'll we'll come back around to that. Yeah, no, just related to that, and this may be what you're thinking about um, is the idea of efficiency. Um, and again, you know, I'm not an economist, but my understanding of efficiency is that it's a ratio. It's you know, you look at what you put in and you look at what you get out, and if you get a lot out for what you put in, then something is you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty pretty good deal. It's a pretty good effort. Um, and when we look at corn, um, you know, part of the logic for the United States growing everybody's corn is the idea that the U.S. is more efficient at growing corn um, and that Mexican small scale subsistence farming um, is inefficient. Um, but again, if we think about the ratio, um, we have to think about what's going in and what's coming out. And to get the incredibly massive yields per hectare that we get in U.S. commodity corn, um, we have to look at all of the inputs. We have to look at the, the patented corn uh, 
the, the seeds, we have to look at the chemicals, we have to look at Roundup um, that's being sprayed on the crops, we have to look at um, the million dollar tractors, we have to look at the administrative wings of most farm operations where they're you know, applying for and, and administering the subsidies that are coming from the federal government. Um, if we look at small scale subsistence, subsistence farming, oftentimes the plots of land are so small and irregular that you can't even have a tractor. It, it, it makes no sense to have a tractor. Um, they might be rain fed or they might be irrigated partially. Um, the seeds are saved from one year to the next, so nobody is, you know, making a, a profit. Seeds are not intellectual property. Um, very few chemicals um, are often used. And so we see, you know, yes, very small yields, but there's very little that's going into that production. And, in fact, it's damaging um, the, the environment far less than, you know, the much more chemically intensive production. All right. Well, so uh, I want to go back. Let me let me let's just go back over that. I w- want to talk first just to to go back to the idea of of, of free trade and that um, and and I, I will say that, you know, there are I mean, there are economists who, who make the point. Um, uh, Dean Baker comes to mind who says, like, these aren't free free trade. I mean, we hear that, uh, you mm-hmm. know, and whether it's TPP mm-hmm. or this, it's not really free trade. It's just a word that's associated with it. And it sounds good. But I mean, and, and you're not an economist. But do, I mean, can we I mean, are there examples even of free trade? I mean, do we I mean, is it is it I mean, I guess maybe within the, in the context of the European Union, within the context of it. Um, yeah, you see, you see free trade there, but I mean, um, do we don't, but they're I mean, also maybe taking not even into there. consideration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go yeah ahead. I, I can't point to any, I can't point to any because I mean, it's a, it's, it, it can lead to some, you know, cruelties. There, there are harsh aspects to the market. You can have people plant and earn nothing and you can have people, um, you know, grow more than the market wants and, and, uh, go bankrupt. You know, there's a lot of, um, unpredictable factors, you know, I'm, I, I'm not an expert in this, but, you know, uh, part of the reason we have subsidies is to try to smooth those things over. Um, but, but what we end up having is a very hybrid system that's protecting some, the interests of some are being protected and some are being insulated from exposure to risk while others are bearing all the risk. And that's the point of my book really is that, you know, there are, you know, the the little guy in in all three countries is bearing more of the risk. Um, you know this rhetoric about Mexico winning and the U.S. losing is is a false rhetoric because it's working people in all three countries that are losing. It's people who are vulnerable to the vagaries of the market who you know have feast or famine situations um, in terms of the jobs available to them, and you know we're left with the crumbs after everything else has sort of been sorted out by, by the power brokers um, who are, who are, you know, the 1% and the, and the corporations who are really managing these situations to their own benefit and for their own profit motives in all three countries. But it's, uh, it's working people who are, who are left with, you know, a really miserable situation. And that's the losing and the winning that we have to be attentive to. All right, and, and, and I want to go through um, uh, how um, uh, how uh, those folks are are losing um, here and in Mexico. Us folks, right? Uh, yes, unless indeed. Unless you're a billionaire, it's us folks. Um, <laughs> I like to try and keep it on the down low, uh, but uh, um, so but but I want to but but one of the pl- ways that that uh, certainly uh, Mexicans are losing is a function of what you were talking about in terms of the corn, which I think is fascinating. So. The idea of this comparative advantage um, suggests that if something's called corn in the United States, it's the same thing as corn in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, it is is not. Um, and the nature of our corn, when used in the way that Mexicans use corn, is, I mean, it's like, it's almost like poison. Right. I mean, yeah. so, yeah. OK, walk us through that, because this dynamic, I think, is fascinating because, you know, the the idea is like, what difference does it make? Um, exactly. In addition to the fact that we're what what we're doing in terms of displacement of people in uh, in, in rural areas in Mexico. I want to talk about that. But just let's just talk about the cultural use uh, of of corn as a food product 
when it comes from the United States, it's not the same corn, and that means something. Right. So I think about 95% of the corn grown in the United States is one of two varieties um, that have been um, engineered to be uh, very high uh, starch and sugar content. They have less fiber, less protein than um, than heirloom races of corn. And they have been um, basically gr- cultivated uh, over time to, to engineered over time to produce um, characteristics that are favorable to industrial uses. Um, so a lot, virtually all of that corn doesn't get eaten in any way that we think of as corn, right? When we think of, you know, sweet corn that we eat in August, um, you know, with butter and, and salt on it um, at, at a, you know, a picnic or a barbecue, that corn is not what we're talking about when we talk about corn in the United States. That's a tiny little infinitesimal fraction of, of the corn um, cultivation in the United States. But the vast majority of it, we never see as corn. It's, be, it's, it's industrial corn that's going straight into corn syrups, corn starches, corn fillers, uh, corn well, meal, and... and, and um, almost every you know, product on the shelf in uh, your supermarket, you pull down and you will see some... Uh, it will either explicitly say cornstarch or it will be some other um, uh, ingredient that you cannot pronounce that is based yep. upon corn in some way. I'm, I'm virtually everything exactly. that's in a box and not in saran wrap, essentially, in your supermarket um, probably has this unless it explicitly is trying to sell itself as without corn. Uh, I think even McDonald's chicken nuggets have more corn than chicken. Um, you know, these are, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. If, if you take, you know, you pull out a hair from the average American's head and test it, you know, we're, we're people of the corn far more than anybody else historically. Um, we are corn. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in everything we eat. And, and I have a list that I you know, cite from, from another source in my book and one of the footnotes, I think it's 45 different um, terms of um, chemicals and, and product uh, ingredients um, that go by other names, maltose, dextrose, right. all of the, super, you know, all of the different um, ways, uh, guises that, that corn might be um, hiding in, um, in industrialized food products. Um, and, we, and ethanol, right? It gets used for ethanol. It gets used for all kinds of industrial purposes. And factory purposes. farming of, of, of meat, essentially. Of uh, meat, uh, and, yeah. Um, and, which, by the way, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not... Uh, new providing any new information on this but you know we can look at michael Pollan's work you know in terms of how you know cows are not meant to to eat corn and so if you feed them a diet based on corn you have to give them antibiotics and other things to um to enable them to digest it because they're grass feeders so anyway there's a lot of there's a whole bunch of issues right there's a lot of uh, issues that are problematic about our our essentially our corn policy in this country it it was the early 70s when mm -hmm. we decided we want consumers to have more uh spending power and one of the ways that we did that is our government began to subsidize corn heavily because it would make food products cheaper and a smaller portion of our disposable income would go towards food and then theoretically we would buy more uh products et cetera et cetera that that is um that's that's a first order problem for the united states it's a second order problem for mexico because when this corn gets to mexico they don't use it to as filler in their products they don't use it as a sugar substitute uh, they don't use it to feed their cattle. They use it in the way that they have always used corn, which is very different than the way we do. And well, talk they about do. That. They do both, right? So, so when we when when U.S. corn, because we have so much of it, we try to get everybody else to use it too, right? So Mexico, since NAFTA, has vastly increased its consumption of processed foods and vastly increased its consumption of soda, of, of livestock, of, of meat. Um, and so all of these things are things that are built on the, on on that cheap corn, um, all of the offshoot industries that have transformed the Mexican diet. And so the way that the average Mexican eats is much more similar today because of NAFTA to the standard American diet than it ever was before NAFTA. So that is, they are eating it the way that we eat it as well. But they also 
um, have a tradition of having a corn-based diet, the milpa-based diet. The milpa is a corn field where you have intercropped corn, beans, and squash, um, which goes back, you know, thousands of years in the region. And their tortillas, um, which are the staple food in, in the Mexican diet historically, tamales, tlacoyos, I could go on and on and on, all the things that Mexicans jokingly call vitamina T, vitamin T, all the word, the wonderful words that start with T, including tacos. Um, the, you know, the, the corn-based diet is, is based on heirloom varieties of corn, which are incredibly nutritious, when they're combined with beans, they're a perfect protein. You actually don't need any animal protein apart from that. Um, although people, you know, people did eat animal protein, but generally a much smaller quantity than they do today. Um, and they grind it. They they nixtamalize it, which is a wonderful way of of um, infusing it with mineral lime, which uh, releases and makes bioavailable the niacin, the vitamin B that makes uh, corn so nutritious and prevents um, pellagra and other uh, deficiencies that we see when corn is eaten without that sort of processing, that that um, that uh, release of, of the, vi the vitamins and nutrients. Um, and they, you know, have a, a marvelous variety of, of uses for the corn. What we're seeing now, which is really tragic, it was scandalous a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a, a revelation that a lot of the tortillas that are being eaten in Mexico are coming from maseca, which is dried corn flour that comes in a, a sack that you can get it at the supermarket. You can get it in a U.S. supermarket these days as well as every supermarket in Mexico. And, and Mexico has tortillerias, which are fresh tortilla factories that are also frequently now using this dried bagged uh, commercial corn flour. That commercial corn flour is still supposed to be produced from Mexican corn uh, because uh, Mexican, um, the Mexican government has prohibited uh, GMO corn. It has prohibited Monsanto from, from uh, testing its, uh, its uh, GMO corn in the Mexican environment. Um, but guess what? Maseca is full of glyphosate. It's full of GMO corn. Um, and so this is a sign that either uh, Mexicans are being fed um, corn that was never intended to be eaten in the form of tortillas. And so the corporations are passing off U.S. corn as Mexican corn. Or there's corn being grown in Mexico that's being uh, purchased from Monsanto. So either way, this is a problem. It's a problem for health. It's a problem for um, for the economy. It's a problem for small corn growers. And we're seeing, you know, all of the array of health problems that that stem from this kind of industrialized food diet. All the non-communicable diseases. The diabetes has become the number one killer in Mexico since NAFTA. Um, we've seen this explosion of health issues. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that because the implications of this are uh, obviously on people's health, on public policy, on the expenditures of the government. I mean, it it, it has a, a ripple effect, and it is. I mean, how how big of a change is it on the culture of of Mexico and on the life of Mexico and and just sort of just Mexican society? I mean, uh, I think yeah. it's easy for people to sort of. You know, well, okay. There, there's a higher rate of diabetes. You know, it happens. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, like, right. you know, like, I mean, just how, how, what, what kind of impact does this have? Well, it's all, it's, it's a whole array of issues. So one is the disruption in the countryside, which has displaced so many people. So a lot of people are no longer living in the places or in the communities that they grew up in. And there's a very strong link between trauma and violence and diabetes. And so as many as 10% of the Mexican population moved to the United States after NAFTA. Right. So when we hear, you know, the president and other people talking about an immigration issue, it's an issue that was produced by U.S. policy because it displaced so many people from the countryside. So you have people living in new environments, eating in new ways, experiencing trauma um, that makes the body you know, changes the way the body metabolizes sugar. And then you have a completely transformed uh, food environment in which, um, you know, Mexico is now number one consumer in the world of instant noodles. Um, people can't afford, uh, both in terms of time and money, they can't afford to eat 
their traditional foods, which are labor intensive, uh, which require access to fresh ingredients. And so people are eating ramen noodles and they're having a Coke, uh, a liter of Coke while they work because it provides sugar and caffeine to get you through the workday when you don't have time or money to eat a proper meal. Um, and the consequences are severe because diabetes, so it's number one killer, but, you know, when we think about diabetes in the United States, we often think about it as, you know, something that nobody wants to have, but it's a pretty manageable thing. For most people, it gets addressed early and it can be, um, it can be dealt with over over decades. Um, in Mexico, it tends to be diagnosed much later, and it tends much more often to to be fatal. Um, so people are, you know, being diagnosed at a stage when they can no longer reverse the effects through, you know, either diet and exercise or or um, insulin treatment. And so we see, you know, this incredible death toll, which is actually, you know, bigger each year than the entire drug war put together. Um, And, you know, we, we have a lot of information about that, right? There are Netflix series, and there are, you know, scandalous news reports every day of the week about drug violence, but we don't hear about the slow death of diabetes that's claiming many more lives. Um, And so, okay, so let's, um, Let's talk about that the, the 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 second aspect, or, or at least in terms of like the, the the that dynamic between the free flow of capital, which we, you know we clearly have here, right? And these these mm-hmm. these theories coming out of these uh, neoliberal policies coming out of the University of Chicago, uh, these like I guess uh, libertarian um, uh, policies that. Uh, are, are quite similar in terms of uh, of, of globalism that, that came out of Mont Pelerin, and I, and it was Quinn Slobodian uh, who uh, had uh, had written a book, uh, "The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism," that talked about at least mm. this agenda in theory, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And NAFTA is it in practice? Um, and so what? So what would it look like if? I mean, how is the idea? Because you. you the 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 book essentially says the idea of NAFTA the, the problem is not that we shouldn't have a relationship uh, a trade relationship with with Mexico the problem is this is a relationship that benefits only one class of people and right. so how would how would it be different and if it um, if it was a, a a trade agreement that benefited all the classes of people, or at the very least, maybe it excluded the capital, you know, these billionaires, um, with all due respect to our large billionaire contingent that listens to the program. But, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, what would it look like, and and what would be the different dynamics in terms of immigration, and in terms of, I mean, what, give us a sense of what it would look like, if properly done, and what maybe the, the broad policy strokes would be to get there. Right. Well, Sam, I don't know. Did you get your invitation to the to the trade talks? Because mine seems to have gotten lost in the mail. I don't think that we were invited to sit down at this table. Um, we were not part of the discussion. And I think that, you know, when I say we, I mean everybody, right? Like all, all of us who, who are impacted by these deals, but we're not at the table. Who is at the table? Um, you know, uh, Trade deals are negotiated under what's called fast fast track authority, which is basically when Congress thinks that something's going to be too sticky to get through our democratic channels the normal way, they send it behind closed doors. They have you know negotiators who are deputized to to work on behalf of the u s government. They hammer out a deal and then they come back and tell us what the deal is and and our congressional representatives have the option to vote it up or down um oftentimes the deal itself is pretty much a black box right we already know that con- congress people don't always read the bills that are not being negotiated behind closed doors but these are really giant deals with a lot of complexity and everybody just kind of lets the trade negotiators who've been you know deputized to do this for us um sit down at the table and work it out for us. Um, There are a lot of really scary things in this deal. Um, 
in, in the original NAFTA, but also in the new, newly revised version of NAFTA. So one of the things is uh, these uh, trade arbitration courts that are sort of a supranational um, realm where these you know, are the companies investor like dispute resolution uh, exactly. agreements. They can they can sue Mexico or the United States. They can they have you know kind of power to sue governments for not adhering to the rules of trade just for protecting their own people. So Mexico can actually be found liable to vi for violating the ter terms of NAFTA um, because it wants to, for example, um, keep GMO corn outside out of its out of its economy um, or it wants to protect its local corn growers um, you know these are things that are very problematic for our idea of democracy and um, we you know we're not being consulted so if if and and the corporations by the way in theory are also not at the table but we already know that there's a revolving door between right. a lot of agencies in Washington and the corporate sector to begin with so we can't imagine that there's really a firewall between corporate interests and government negotiators anyway um, but they have other ways they have you know right billion and, and, dollar okay. um, marketing budgets without a doubt clear and, what they and, want. and you know under under uh, Obama it was a former Citibank uh, employee who uh, you know city uh, city group uh, Froman and I mean they're uh, industry indus and they are getting you know under TPP anyways um, they were getting a lot of uh, of the uh, heads up on what was being negotiated. But putting aside exactly. the uh, dispute resolution thing, which essentially strips countries of their sovereignty, does not exactly. it penalizes. And it also can penalize states, too. If a specific state wants yeah. to protect, uh, you know, a, a specific, you know, the uh, state EPA wants to pass a law. They've yeah, got to almond make, growers or whatever. They yeah. could theoretically end up having to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to just simply um, exercise the will of the people through their own government, or they will not do it because they don't want to get involved in lawsuits. But getting to exactly getting to the the other parts that are sort of uh, you know more you know structural, like what would it right. look like in terms of people? What would the people right. element of this be in, in, in how it implicates immigration? Well, one of the things that we would want to think about, you know, is is why did we leave people off of the table, right? I mean, we've got, you know, tear gas being sprayed at babies um, on Sunday at the U.S.-Mexico border. That border, um, why why is it? Why do we feel such a need to wall off our trading partner? What if we didn't? militarize that border. Um, and instead of just letting goods and, and capital flow, we actually allowed people legally to go where the jobs are. Um, you know, that would be one thing to consider. It would solve a lot of issues. Um, another thing to consider would be what, it w what would it look like if our food system had food at its heart and not industrial commodities at its heart, right? So instead of thinking about how much, you know, industrial corn and soy we can grow, what if fruits and vegetables were given priority? What if we, you know, if we were going to subsidize things, why not subsidize things that are actually good for us, um, that are expensive? You know, fruit shouldn't be a luxury item um, when we go to the supermarket. It shouldn't be, you know, I'm going to splurge today on a pound of grapes, Um but that's the situation that we're in today. And, you know, our health and our well-being are being put secondary to corporate interests. So if we actually had people at the table who said, well, these are the ripple effects. This is what this is going to mean in terms of diet-related illness over the long run if people don't have access to fruits and vegetables and they're being, you know, inundated and, and buried by this avalanche of processed foods. Um, we might have a very different approach to trade and, and just the idea of progress and prosperity. It would look very, very different. So is there is there is 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 that concept of comparative advantage, is that even salvageable? Because it occurs to me that there's just like, you know, too many things are too integrated in many ways. I mean, there's two issues with it, right? One is too many things are too integrated in too many ways into a society. Uh, if it's a significant um, portion, you know, as measured by a significant portion of the economy or even just in terms of people's daily life, if there was some other uh, metric to measure that. Um, uh, right. A and B, that also raises some issues in terms of the, the security, uh, food security. I mean, just, uh, right. I mean, you see it maybe it's more obvious. Look at the Romaine. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we're so susceptible. We're so we're so compartmentalized. We have, you know, such a small handful of producers, um, giant behemoth corporate um, monsters that are controlling our entire food system. That if there's one problem, it ripples out, and it can it can make millions of us vulnerable. You know, we nobody had. Caesar salad for the last week because, right. you know, there was E. coli um, in, in our food system. And it's so complicated and so big that, you know, it's not like you can isolate, okay, that's the rem- romaine that needs to be destroyed because it might have been contaminated. We have to assume that the entire system is contaminated because it's so giant. It's such an integrated system. Um, that's a problem. Uh, monocultures are a problem. We shouldn't be growing so much corn um, in the United States. We should be having a more biodiverse um, agricultural system where we're producing more things than just commodity corn coming out of our ears. Um, so, you know, there's, there are environmental issues, health issues, economic reasons, and cultural reasons why, you know, Mexico should still grow corn. Um, we should be growing a multitude of, of crops in a multitude of ways um, to protect ourselves from, from you know, the, from climate change, from, you know, if there's some superbug that comes through um, that gets around the roundup, um, think about, you know, the, the famine that could right. result because we're all depending on these monocrops. Um, so we need a system that's, that's um, more balanced. You know, I, I don't want to get rid of global trade. I live in the Northeast. I would be eating apples and potatoes nine months a year. Um, I like having avocados. Um, but how can we strive for a system that is um, a recognition of our codependence, of the diversity of our palates and of our of our societies, right? Where we have access to a variety of products, um, but we don't have a system that's so precarious and that's so um, razor focused only on corporate profits. Um, all right. Lastly, Alicia, if I could just ask you, uh, Jamie uh, just came back from uh, Chiapas and saw mm. a caravan of internally displaced people. Um, mm. uh, nearly a thousand or so, maybe a little more. More than a thousand. And um, mm. what wh- what is your sense of of when you see uh, internally displaced, uh, ostensibly coming from uh, rural areas, uh, ostensibly by uh, you know paramilitary groups, uh, probably yep. doing the bidding of of the government slash uh, corporate patrons. Uh, what I mean, where does that fit into this? Yeah, it's all interrelated. Um, the security issues, um, you know, Mexico has had to um, somewhat perversely modify, you know, its government's mission um, to suit this model of, of foreign direct investment and development, which really leaves a lot of things that a healthy society needs um, outside, and it leaves them, you know, it, it, it leaves them in the in the cold. Um, you know, a healthy society needs a robust um, uh, system of laws and and uh, legal accountability, so that um, you know people who are uh, you know taking those old cornfields in Michoacan and turning them to to opium, um, you know, face consequences for doing that, and the and the organized crime that's um, that's so rampant. You know, the new president coming in has said, you know, accountability um, and transparency in the legal system is the number one issue that he has to tackle. And everything is sort of radiating out from that. But a lot of it, you know, when we see in Central America, when we see the 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 migrant caravans that are crossing borders and the, and the caravans of people who are internally displaced, a lot of them are running from the worst um wounds caused by this sort of neoliberal model of development that's making it impossible for people to stay. Um, It's making it impossible for them to, you know, David Bacon has this, you know, the right to stay, the right to leave, the right to stay. Um, And a lot of us, you know, in the United States who, who are worried about migrant rights, you know, are worried about how are we treating migrants and refugees. But we also have to think about do people have the option of not migrating? Can they stay where they are um, and, you know, have access to to the basic necessities of life? And increasingly the answer is no, um, because of climate change and because of these, you know, these um, 
organized crime networks that are making life impossible in a lot of communities. And I think, you know, we have to really reconsider what we think of, you know, in the book, I'm writing a lot about food security, but I think it's security, um, right? Speak. Food is one aspect, um, but it's how we think about all of these things. And I think we've boiled down our notion of security to this really paranoid, narrow notion of like, protecting ourselves from terrorism, um, which, you know, there's, well, there are other kinds of terrorism behind, besides, you know, the way it's sort of conventionally defined. And it, that includes, you know, being unable to stay where you are. Yep. And we also have to, of course, protect ourselves from the caravan. Um, uh, Alicia <laughs> Galvez, the book uh, is Eating NAFTA, Trade, Food Policies, and the Destruction of Mexico. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you. it. All right, folks. To talk to you. Thank you. Um, all right, folks. Going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half. Get bonus time today. Super bonus. Folks, uh, don't forget, this program exists because of its members. You can help um, support this program, the, the free part of the program. And then, as a thank you, we give you extra content every day. By becoming a member of the Majority Report, you simply go over to jointhemajorityreport.com, uh, click on the link, become a member, choose your membership. If you want to do a one-off donation, uh, instead of becoming a member, that's fine too. If you don't uh, have the funds, but you want the fun half, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We will help you out. Uh, we never turn anybody away for finances. Also, reminder, we are now 45 days away from the live Majority Report show. And how fast are tickets selling? Uh, extremely fast, like, like sacks like of potatoes. Sacks of potatoes. They are, potatoes they are selling falling. with the same ease in which sacks of potatoes fall from high distances. Mm. Um, you can go to uh, Majority uh, Report radio.com majority.fm and uh, click the link or you can head over to the uh, Brooklyn pod fest. And I would also imagine you could find it at um, the bell house uh, website as well. We are doing the live show January 13th, 2 30 PM on a Sunday. It is 18 and over. So if you are um, 18 and over, you can come. Uh, tickets, 15 bucks, going to be a fun time. May have a special guest, may not. We may not even show. I'm right. joking. Of course we'll show. Speak uh, for yourself. Justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Uh, tonight is Tuesday, November 27th, the, the Michael Brooks Show. Richard Wolf is here. That is going to be a major showdown. The tension between him and David Griscom is electric. Uh, Richard Wolf actually, and I talked to him about this on the phone over break. So a lot of people are saying it's like Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. It's sort of like Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. I think of it more in terms of a sort of you know rising, like maybe like the Genovese family trying to open new turf uh, in the against the Gambinos. I think that's how I see Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. You think of it? I could see that. Although I think they're equivalent families. Right, well, don't point. let the air. That's out on of the time, Michael Brooks guy. show. I mean, <laughs> all right, all right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Michael Brooks show on YouTube. Uh, we're streaming live at 7. We're also covering Northern Ireland and Brexit. And for the Michael Brooks live show on February 1st, it's like empty sacks of potatoes or how fast those are going. Whoa. So, boom, get yours also on the Majority Report. Uh, fill fill your sack or empty the sack. Fill or empty your sack or whatever. They're also there at the Bell House, and it's uh, Friday, February 1st, 21 and above. Wow. Ooh. <laughs> Exclusive. Ooh. The era wow. of the pajama. The era boy. of the pajama. The era of all day matinee access for everyone is over. <laughs> Jamie? Yeah. So uh, Sean and I just got back from Mexico. Uh, apologies if I'm still a little bit out of it. I got in pretty late last night, but. Um, we had the honor of visiting the autonomous Zapatista community of Oventique and seeing their principles in action. They're basically libertarian socialists, although they don't identify strictly with any historical tendency. They've made it clear that they're their own thing. So that was incredibly I'm meaningful I'm calling from Chiapas with a libertarian perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I was just 
say it. I was like, oh I don't God. care about this happy teas. How do you build the road? And <laughs> it ties in with a lot of what we were just talking about, actually, in the interview. Um, so we're p- working on putting together an episode based around that. Um, in the meantime, we also have a crossover edition of History is a Weapon with Jake Flores and Alex Patak of the show Pod Damn America, in which Sean and Jake and Alex go over the history, ideology, and practice of the Industrial Workers of the World, or IWW, which is a famous revolutionary union. Check that out. Patreon.com, The Antifada. And Matt? Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. Uh, recent eps have been on sort of Massachusetts Bay Colony and racism and feminism and things like that. Uh, coming up uh, this week for patrons will be more of my narration. I'm going to try to do uh, to finish up Hope Leslie for people, so you can check that out. And the week after that is my Democracy in Chains breakdown. So Whoa. Can't wait for that one. Democracy in Chains is a great book. It's very funny to see how... Well, I'm not going not gonna to leave. Don't let the air out of the tires. Don't let the air out of the tires. Don't let the air out of the tires. have the fully let it. loaded tires. All right, folks. Yeah, quick break. Head into the uh, fun half. 646-257-3920 is the number. See you there.